Welcome everybody to the new studio. And I have Luke Travers, who wrote the book Stories in Paint, as well as Touching the Art. And Luke is visiting Austin after doing a monthly event that I do in Austin called Third Thursday. And we did, he did a whole bunch of tours in Austin and Houston. I actually got a van, got a whole bunch of friends together, and we drove up to Houston. And I wanted to start, and we're going to talk about art, we're going to talk about education, we're talking about history, love, literature. I don't know, I'm just throwing in stuff in there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about mechanics and how, why do airplanes have holes in them and things like that. Oh, okay. Good. I just I'm learned this from Elon Musk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but we're going to talk about art and art history and, and education and prim primarily. But okay. I wanted to start off with something in, that I found interesting. I don't know if you'll find this interesting or not. But on the way back from Houston with my busload of friends that we brought up from Austin, we were talking about a whole bunch of things. And one of the things that we discussed was why was the fandoms of Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. And I have my theory about this, but I've noticed that as these remakes are happening, as you know, these types of things are happening, there's a kind of virulent anger and almost violence on the Star Wars fandom people. Not everybody. I mean, most people are chill about it, but there's, there seems to be a real, like, I'm going to kill that guy for messing up this character, or this, you know, lore, and they got it so wrong, it's so horrible. Now, Lord of the Rings had the same type of thing where there was a, there was a kind of, there were these prequels, people loved the Lord of the Rings. I know people who've watched them every year, the extended on Christmas. I did this with a couple friends this last year. Um, and they love Lord of the Rings. There's a lot of love for those first three movies. And then the prequels, not so much, right? Uh, the Hobbit movies. The Hobbit movies, thank you. And yet, with the Lord of the Rings fandom, I don't notice or see or hear about the virulence, the violence, the I'm going to kill you. It's more like, even in that van, disparity was very interesting. So we had... We were talking about Star Wars. People got passionate about it with what was stupid. They argued about lightsabers and stuff. And, the, you know, why do they have midichlorians? Like, oh, it's a freaking Matt. What do you want? You know? And both the Lord of the Rings, the person who is the biggest Lord of the Rings fan, they're like, yeah, I didn't like the prequels. And then they were done. And that was it. And I just found that was really interesting. And I've noticed that kind of thing. And I don't know if you, I have my theory, but I want to see if you have anything. Well, may I? broaden it out a little bit sure. and then I'll, I'll, I'm interested in your theory so when I hear this this resonates because I think art in general arouses a lot of division a lot of passion and oftentimes this comes especially when there's an interpretation of a source text that you already have a connection with I'm thinking of the Game of Thrones yeah. and how everybody kind of loved it at first and adhered to the books. The, the book fans enjoyed it. And then when it got towards the end of the series, it caused a lot of division because it seemed to depart a little bit from the story or the, the story wasn't as well paced and nobody really liked it. But the book fans also especially didn't like okay, it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah, so I... I, it's fascinating to to think that there's there are some subcultures of fans that aren't as upset by interpretations of the source text that they love, like the Lord of the Rings fans. But I think in general, when you bond with a work of literature and it's adapted, whether in a painting or in a in a movie or a TV show. You have your vision of it, and you're going to be more critical of what it is that this a director or or painter is going to create mm -hmm. and because if it clashes with your vision you're going to say you know what that's not the way i saw it <laughs> uh and i think a lot of star wars fans were expecting the prequels to be kind of i remember i saw the prequel 1996 was it mm -hmm. i went to the movie theaters really excited to see it and all i remember was this silly kid who did not know the controls of his ship and it was flying through. It was like, oh, what does this button do? And he blows up <laughs> something and he saves a day by being like the force, I guess, is going through him. Yeah, and then he's doing pod racing. And it, for me, it felt really juvenile, mm -hmm. which was a big How difference. 1996, I was, was it? I was 19, 20 years old. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it felt to me juvenile. 
While Star Wars, which I didn't see till I was like 12, 13 because I wasn't in the country, it was aspirational. Here's this young hero who's breaking away from his parents to go off and do something grand. That, I was primed for that. But then the story shifted into this children's story. Hmm. And that wasn't for me. So that's a case where there wasn't a source story that I had bonded with, like the Lord of the Rings. It was just this, I was hoping for a similar kind of experience as I mm -hmm. had before, mm -hmm. and I was not getting it with the prequels. Yeah. And maybe there are a lot of, there's a variety of reasons for that. For me, I, like all these new Star Wars TV shows, uh, Ahsoka, uh, Obi-Wan Obi -Wan. Kenobi, yeah. uh, and Andor. And, uh, Andor's an exception. Yeah. Andor's a, <laughs> and the I'm exception for me. Andor. But all these others are based on a lot on these cartoons that were done, the Clone Wars cartoons mm -hmm. that are serving a children audience. Yeah. And they're not for me. Okay. So, yeah, I think there's a couple things there. One, I, I agree with the, the way that we bond with art. And you notice that where people will bond irrationally in a sense where they think that this is objectively great art even just because they grew up with it. Now we could have a debate. Maybe it is objective because to them it is, and that's fine. But, you know, like I remember seeing this interview with 50 Cent, uh, the great and powerful mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, wise 50 mm -hmm, Cent. Mm -hmm. He actually is pretty smart. But he um, was talking about like, you know, someone was asking him like, who's the greatest rapper? And he said, whoever was in the club when you were in the club as a kid, right? That's who the greatest rapper is because – you know, if you were in the club in the 90s, it was going to be like Dre and NWA and those types of people. And if it was the early 2000s, it'd be like M or late 90s and early 2000s, Eminem and then 50 Cent in the, you know, 2002 to 7 or whatever. So it's whoever that – and he acknowledges that that truth of the subjectivity of whoever was hot when you were falling in love you know, kissing a girl at the club or whatever. When you're having those experiences and bonding with the art at that time, of course, 20 years later, when you're schlumpy at your couch and you hear that, that jam, you're like, yeah, it brings me back, right? It kind of brings us back. So there's that subjectivism that people get almost violently mad about uh, when they're hearing new generations that are like making mumble rap or something. It's like, that's not rap. So there's that component I agree completely. Now, the, the weird thing about the Star Wars Lord of the Rings thing is they both corrupted source material in a sense. Like the Hobbit is a corruption of the source material, clearly. Like, you know, they have uh, Legolas in it and he's not in the Hobbit. right? So they, they just so they have all these kinds of things that are clearly that. So here is my quick answer to this. And by the way, the whole reason I'm setting this up is just to kind of talk about this connection with art, but also... This we had such great art experiences, and so we were at your tour in Houston, and we want to have those. And I think you're right; people definitely have those experiences with movies. Star Wars, in particular, for whatever reason, has that experience for a lot of people. And but the thing that I think is different is that this where what the source material is. So Star Wars st source material is a movie; mm -hmm. it's a cinema. Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings is literature. Okay. It's real literature. So there's a real base. And I, I think there's a different mentality when someone comes from that base. And that there, because when you read Lord of the Rings, which I was not that great a fan of it, but it's, it's pretty serious, deep literature in a sense. Like it's difficult. There's complexities to the language. The way he's describing things is very, you know, it, it's a, it trains the mind in a certain way. Like it stretches people who read it. And so I think that type of person who loves literature and art, who loves Lord of, the, Lord of the Rings from literature, is less likely by their temperament to get that kind of virulence okay. versus, I think, someone who's from the medium of movies where it's more pure emotion and more pure emotion coming at you and you're a little bit more passive than the kind of active integration. So to me, there's a more confidence you get when you integrate and you interpret an art form yourself all on your own just blank scrawls on a page you have to see what this character looks like in your you, you'll have a connection to it but i think you're more confident in that connection because you did the work versus star wars does it all for you it's got the music it tells you who to love who to hate who to move what they look like 
So it could still be great, and it's a wonderful experience. I'm not denigrating the experience, but it's fundamentally different, is my view. So that's my argument. Okay. So book readers are smarter, yes. more, confident. more confident. Movie watchers are dumber and let yeah. things sweep over them passively. Well, I was trying to say that like a little bit implicit, but thank you for pointing it out. But I, um, I, do, I don't think that movie goes, I love movies. I was a film major, to be clear. Oh, you were? Yeah. So I love movies. That's not my actual point. But I do think like if you have that as your base, that that's, you know, that I think that's a cause for this kind okay. of feelings versus the equanimity that comes from the training that literary art can give you. So I'm an advocate of both. Do both. Like enjoy movies. So that's my argument. A couple of thoughts come to that. A couple of questions and a couple of flashbacks for me. I have I teach literature and I have a lot of students who read the novels with me and then go watch the movies afterwards mm -hmm. and they have strong feelings about the movies and they say things like no that's not the way Anne of Green Gables looks like okay her <laughs> yeah. hair isn't red enough so I think that there are definitely strong passions about what the sort what the adaptation looks like the other thing is I'm wondering for the audience of Lord of the Rings how many of them read, did read the books I haven't read the books. I watched the movies. Mm. I'm wondering if for mm. most of the audience for Lord of the Rings, they okay. are coming to it for the first time to the yeah. movies in a similar way as with Star Wars. Okay. That's well, my so, thought there. So uh, can I just add one real yeah. quick thing? I agree that that makes sense. But I think the, the, I don't think the people who saw only the Lord of the Rings, they probably were the ones who liked The Hobbit, who never read in the books. In eighth grade? Yeah. Like if so, those people like some people like The Hobbit. Maybe, maybe they don't admit it, but some people liked it, right? It was it made money, or I, it, you know, I don't think it flopped completely. So it's it. Some people liked. It. I think it was the people who probably didn't read it as much, and I think the people who read it were like, "This is so far askew. What's the point?" My thing is like the virulence. Where like Jar Jar Binks, the car the actor, almost killed himself. It was that virulently hate hatred toward him. That's a like what kind of what brings out that attitude in people where it's I'm not arguing that Lord of the Rings fans disliked or liked The Hobbit and they didn't have passionate feelings about it. I think people do have passionate feelings. It's more how it's manifested. And for there's there is a fundamental difference in my observation between people who see the source material just or between the Star Wars mentality of fandom versus the Lord of the Rings fandom, taking out the people who saw Lord of the Rings and didn't read the books. Well, to bring this to education, if my students have that much fiery passion for an adaptation of a novel that they've read with me, mm -hmm. I'm happy. I'm happy. Not if they try to get the guy to kill himself and say he should die. And that all these, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, I agree with the passion. Yeah. I don't agree with how it manifests. That's for me as a fringe. Okay. All right. So that that's just, to me, an interesting, I think it's interesting. We had that. So there's one thing that you said that really intrigued me. Okay. And that's how, well, you didn't say it. 50 Cent said it. <laughs> what is it that who was with, in the club when you were in the club is going to yeah. stick with stick you? Stick with you. As a and player. this idea of the art of your generation is what is going to resonate with you the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. This idea that there is a point in life in your development and your growth as a human being th where art is especially going to be meaningful yeah. because it's going to ha ex uh, reveal and discuss situations and themes that are new to you. And now that I'm in my 40s, I don't have the same resonance with Star Wars because I'm not in the same point of my life as Luke Skywalker was. Hmm. And this is why I love to teach literature because I am getting to share these classics, these great works of literature at the prime art education moment in life for these kids so that they're at a certain point in life where it's going to really mean something to them. Mm -hmm. Now you do a lot of literature yourself, but I, yeah, and I so I don't do them with students as much. I did teach fifth and eighth grade for a short period, and I agree. I think that I was able to have an impact where some of those kids had 
one in particular, the um, John Carter of Mars, Pr- Princess of Mars series. Oh man, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Mm. Great wonders of literature is, you know, the and the, the reality is that probably for most students, you know, even at a good school or if they have a good teacher like you, probably some high percentage of things is not going to connect with them mm-hmm. that much, right? They're just going to get through it and they'll probably have some good connection. And I think if you, as a good teacher, help them get some connection to it, that's great. But I would imagine there's going to be, you know, in 30 years, they're going to look back and be like, that this book really did something big for me or something. And I think they're going to have that passionate connection that'll be really life-changing. It'll be different. So that goes to the question of how do you select the books? And I spent a lot of time thinking about how I select the books. And I think I've got general principles for three phases. In terms of age groups? In terms of age groups. Okay. So for elementary students. This is what to what? This is a first, second, second grade through fifth, sixth grade, something like that. Okay. Okay. And the novels that I generally go to are ones with child protagonists. Yeah. Because I think I view the kind of overarching theme of these stories is maturation. Mm -hmm. How do you grow? What does it look like for you to grow to mature? It's very self-developmental. A lot of these stories are about, okay, this is one phase of my life, and now I've got to move to another phase of my life, and what does that look like? One quick example, Anne of Green Gables, that the elementary students are reading right now with uh, Mrs. Minor at, uh, at my little company, Literature at Our House. And that's a story about a young child with an overactive imagination, fiery-spirited, and she's got to learn a little bit of how to control that or how that matches with the world Mm -hmm. and almost every story that i come across with a child protagonist meant for children has that kind of underlying what does it look like for you to go on to the next age from 9 to 10 10 to 11 11 to 12 what does it look like for you to grow Mm -hmm. children are obsessed with growth okay what do i get to do now that i'm 11 years old Mm. Yeah, like expanding their freedom and their circle of freedom and liberty, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's, interesting. Do you guys read Hatchet? Absolutely. And Hatchet is another one. That's a great example. That's a good example of of maturation. Yeah. Okay, what does it look like for you to develop, what is it would say, not self-control, not self-confidence necessarily. That's a story about a kid who's in an airplane accident and survives, and he has to figure out how to survive in the jungle, essentially, of with Canada. just a hatchet, yeah. right? So, independence the, in a way. Independence, okay. That's that's the one. It's, that's the best. There, one. Yeah. yeah, there's another word that he uses that self reliance, maybe. Self reliance is really good too. Yeah, yeah. Because he's been just living his life as a child. Yeah. And now he's, he's got to take responsibility. Oh, I need to eat, mm-hmm. or nobody's going to come and shoo the mosquitoes away. Yeah. And he has to find it within himself to take action. So yeah. that's elementary level. Yeah, those that makes sense. So you're you're trying to select artworks, literary artworks in this case, that speaks to that student, mm-hmm. and that's your primary speaks speaks to that age group yeah. and what they're actually experiencing. And is that your primary selective tool? Is what speaks to them. So like, why wouldn't you choose Harry Potter or Percy Jackson? That's a good question. Right. So I love Harry Potter and a lot of students already, already read it. They already read Harry Potter and they already read Percy Jackson. So one of the criteria is let's look for works of literature that a student might not immediately pull off of the bookshelf on their Mm -hmm. own. So the goal is not to... The goal is not to encourage, primarily to encourage reading, or even to encourage reading fiction. Hmm. Those are great tangential goals. The primary goal is to fall in love with literature, which means to fall in love with very well-told stories that are very insightful, that might be just a little bit beyond what you would normally reach to to easily read. 
where some guidance, whether it's providing a little bit of historical background or a little bit, the language might be a little bit difficult, so you might read it with your parents or whatever it is. Yeah. It's just a little bit out of your reach. Okay. And maybe something that's the language is more difficult, like Anne of Green Gables. The language Secret is Garden. tough. Secret Garden, the language yeah. is tough. That's tough. Because they but, have that dialect. And, of course. Yeah, yeah. So that that's part of what you're looking for is something that stretches the child in this case. Yeah. Second to sixth graders that they're, these are kids who already know how to read, of course. They're maybe reading, my age, I was reading a lot of Hardy Boys, Goosebumps, yeah, yeah. which is really simple. It's like designed to be sold. And it's fun to oh, read. I loved it. Yeah. yeah. I read every single yeah. book. And they're basically, the, the goosebumps are all basically the same story with the same theme. Okay, what, what kind of scares Whoa. you? Right. I, won't, I won't deny <laughs> that. I won't um, deny that. But yeah, like, <laughs> I haven't read there's it. definitely, I'm sh I haven't investigated as an adult. So as a kid, you know, it's puppets versus vampires. That's different, right? So it's like, that's way, but maybe you're, I'm sure you're right that it's basically a monster tale told over and over again with yeah. slight variations. Sure. Anyway, I'm not going to argue about Arl Stein and get all furious. But I, I will say, agree with, but I, that makes a lot of sense to me in terms of the the value of what literature, the, like selecting literature at that age group in particular. Now I have, so I, I wanted to talk about role of art in general, yeah. but we let's, since we're on literature, let's stick here for a little bit. Cause, so one of the things I've been thinking about as someone who's just studied literature and a lot and a, studied a little bit of education and pedagogy and the philosophy of education. I have some experience in teaching, but I've never run a school. There's a lot of real life problems you have to deal with. So it's easy to have theories of like what kids should do, right? And what they should, like they should know the Iliad and the Odyssey by the time they're 15 frontwards and backwards or something like that, right? Which is a feeling, I don't have that quite feeling, but that I'll get like to like a it. classical. Education. Yeah, like a kind of classical thing. So I, I have like a little bit of a different take, uh, although I think both are possible in a sense, I believe. So I part of what I think needs to happen, even in, starting in the early years, is you, you have to think about like from what is general education as a, a specialized moment in our lives and a specialized type of training, right? So there's gymnast, gymnastics type training where you're trying to train their bodies a little bit. You might do musical trainings to drain some of their spiritual things, What a, socializing at the playground. But in the classroom from the ages of, you know, four, five, six years old till today now 18 or really 22 or 23, there's a kind of generalized, this is something that a human, that we believe a human should have. Whatever field that they go into, to be a better human, to have the most ch best chance of living a great life, in our complex society that we live in. And this is not, I don't believe in having this be any technical training. I think kids should do that on the side. If you see an aptitude in, you know, fixing things, then put them in something else. But I do think there's a value to have like some kind of generalized education. And I think literature is core to that. Literature, math, science, history, core things. So I guess my question is when you're thinking about that overall goal, right? As, as like, what should they know? First off, do you think about that? Is like, is that at all part of what you're selecting for? So when you're saying, is that at all part of what I'm, I'm selecting for, do you mean the an overall program of literature that is asking the question of what is it valuable for a human being to learn? Yes, like what should uh, this kid, let's say you know you're going to have a kid from the age of, you know, six till 16 when he's done or 18. What should that be? kid experience literature wise that you think is mandatory with i'll give caveats to flexibility based on the interests of the child but that you think is you do you have any strong inclinations of like they need to have or they should optimally have these types of literary experiences so literary experiences is a key term in what you're saying here and you can equate that with particular books but I don't necessarily equate that with particular books. I think there's a wide range of books. I do think literature and art, and when we talk about the visual arts, I can share a little bit more of how I think it fits into, I think I have a better sense of how that, that fits into a broader oh, okay. program. Cool. But literature, yeah, I can speak a little bit on that. But 
Literary experiences for me are not primarily about the particular books you read. There are particular books that I really like to teach that over the years have really resonated with my students. And we talk, I talked a little bit about what I, the kind of book I select for elementary, mm -hmm. but I also, also have like a category for like the junior high years and then the high school years. And for when I think of literary experiences, I think primarily of setting the student up for their own private reading experience at a certain point in a story. When they are okay. swept up, on, when they're with a book, like the climax of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and they're reading it on their own, if they are totally into it, and they're wrapped by that, that's the literary experience I want them to have. Not necessarily okay. with a particular book, but with the sense, I understand everything that's going on here. I understand the stakes. I understand how it connects to me. I understand all of it. And it's coming through in this powerful emotional experience as I'm seeing Quasimodo try to decide what to do and looking for Esmeralda and not knowing that she's right over there. All that stuff. But coming to building up not to a test in the classroom, but to their own personal reading experience with like the end of a novel or the climax of a novel, something like that. Yeah, so you're, you're heavily focused on the personal experience of the students, and you've done this. Yes and no. Okay, where's the Because I wanted to the build no? up to that. Where's the no? The no, no. I'm a guide. Okay. I'm a guide. There's a lot that needs to be set up with stories like this. I'll give you one example. Hunchback and Notre Dame. Let me give a different example okay. because that's even that's pretty approachable for a that's a, yeah. an example of a junior high. That's a strong book for a junior high. It's, that's it's pretty strong for a junior. Yeah, high. yeah. But it's one that the theme is really re relatable because it's all about variations in romantic love. And that's one of the standards. I'll just explain very quickly to junior high and high yeah, school to set please, the context. Please. Junior high, I'm looking for adult classics okay. with themes and story situations that would resonate to a 13, 14 year old. Okay. That would resonate. The theme is now, so it's more abstract. In a sense. It's a little bit more abstract. The themes often have to do with their kind of broad categories of themes like justice. Yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird, 12 Angry Men, romantic love, personal identity. What's that one? Pygmalion or uh, A Doll's House. And The Doll's House was the one I wanted to bring up as an example that... That's a junior high? Junior high. A seventh grade boy is not going to pick up that novel or that play. That play yeah. It's not going to pick up Gibson. that play. Yeah. It's Ibsen. Yeah. It's a play about a housewife who thinks she's happy, but so, starts to realize that she isn't happy. Yeah. Torvald, right? That's the husband. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's that's been a right. while since they've read it. Okay. But that is a story that when we come to the end of it, the climax, I'm looking for those junior high boys as well as the girls to be riveted because it matters to them. And the way we connect it to ourselves there, the theme essentially has to do with who do you listen to in your life? Are you going to simply accept what your parents and society tells you is right and wrong? Or are you going to question? And that for a 13 year old okay, I see. is gold. That's gold. So one, Okay. The high school is similar, but what differentiates maybe the junior high is we have some very positive role models to go along with that. Mm. We have Shane. We have Nora from uh, A Doll's House. We have Quasimodo, who's very different from the superficial Phoebus and his orations of love that are mean nothing. It's sincere love versus superficial. We have Atticus Finch. Mm -hmm. So they are these complex adult stories but the themes are relatable to 13 14 year olds and the protagonists are admirable okay so you're focusing on the admirable 
that's the junior high differentiator. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that the stories are going to turn out well. Yeah. One thing I tell my junior high students is I I want you to suffer. At mm-hmm. least I want you to. I want to introduce you to tragedy. Yeah. We will be introduced to tragedy, but we will see characters that we root for. Okay. In the high school, adult classics questions thematic questions that deal with things that they're going through in their life but maybe the answers that the author provides are not ones that you want to emulate Hmm. for example the great gatsby i start off before we read the novel i ask the question something like is it worth pursuing your dreams and the great gatsby has a very definite answer to that Mm mm-hmm and it's not a positive answer. Yeah. Dreams are by nature superficial hmm. and shallow. Yeah, it's been I mean I know that story but it's been a while since. It's been a while. Yeah. But but the idea for the high school is we are interested in c- questions, thematic questions that you're going to relate to. Hmm. We're not looking at the literature f- for literature's sake like oh this is a classic you need to read James Joyce. No. We're not looking at literature that has themes that are more adult. Like there's, there's one, uh, you know, I'm reading Dr. Glass with a, a college student right now, and it's all about... Dr. Glass? Dr. Glass. Never heard it's, of uh, I'd never heard of it either. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're doing some Nordic literature together, but oh, that's, that's okay. dealing with society's views of abortion. Okay. Is this mo- so this is modern, it's contemporary. This is modern contemporary. That's not something that I would teach. Yeah. No, it's not. It's actually like late 19th century. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. But it's not something that I would... Normally teach. Yeah. Teach for the high school students. Okay. But what I do want to get to the high school students is you're going to have these relatable thematic questions. Like, what does justice look like in society? Like, or how does somebody change your world? Mm-hmm. Fahrenheit 451. Mm-hmm. And... Maybe you're going to get answers that come from a different philosophical viewpoint. Okay. And so that's the difference for the high school class. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there because I find that very interesting. And I'd be curious how much of that is the focal point throughout the whole education because. Obviously, in literature. What do you mean by the throughout the whole so education? Like, through that again, literature, art education, or art education as a whole? Uh, general education, right? So, like, because my thought is, you can all. There's a role for both, in a sense. For both what? As in, I'm an advocate. Like, I want people to have personal experiences. Yeah. But we live in a complex world that is built, in my view by the imaginative literature that came before us. And by that, I mean our conception of love and marriage, our conception of work and you know what you're supposed to do with work and your relationship to your family, your relationship to society, your, relation, your duties or non-duties. And all these kinds of things are cool. Like you're putting kids out in this world and then you're supposed to, and it's like figured out stupid. And to me, part of what, and I, not you, but I think that's what, that's what happened to me is my, my feeling, where they didn't really give me the kind of humanities training that I think is essential for living in this complex world that we live in, not to give you all the answers, but to give you the tools to go find the answers properly. And to me, Im- the imaginative literature, the great canonical works, help you in a couple of ways. I think they do a lot of what you say, and but they also, they don't always do that, though. Like I always tell people like you're gonna, there's going to be parts of Dante. You're not going to like, that's just going to be a little boring. You're not going to connect with this character. And yet Dante is one of the most pivotal books in the history of the Western canon. And it's set up the enlightenment and everything that happened afterwards. And so like, it's canonical and it's like, we live in a Dantean post Dantean world in a sense. And so if you don't read that, you're missing out, not just on like, you know, little references here and there, but in substructures of our entire society and world and psyche, I think. Uh, I think literature of the 11th, 12th century troubadours and, you know, these guys, that they're writing stuff that our conception of love and marriage and sex yeah. come there, from there. And it was very different. So my point is that I don't think they need to read everything. But they, for me, there needs to be an exposure 
to some of these, what I would call influent, greatest, most influential works of all time that have built the cultural world that we live in in the West, if you're living in the West, or if you're curious about the West. And now that's another debate is should you do West, East, all of it? I don't know. That's hard questions. I don't have great answers to it. But that to me is a piece of the puzzle I'm not seeing enough of in you know the kind of education individuals that I know about who are I think are amazing. That's what you do. That's better than anything else that's out there in my view. It's it's you know literature 4.0 versus literature 1.0. I'm just thinking that there's a little bit extra of a piece. So what you're describing is there are core texts to Western civilization and that kind of shape how humanity's developed. And you can go back to the Odyssey. You can even go back to Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You can go back and then you can go through and take a look, maybe Augustine's Confessions or, mm-hmm. or Dante. And there are these texts, Milton's Paradise Lost, that might be drier, that might not be as much fun to read, but they were so influential in the development of Western civilization. Understanding those will give you a better sense of where we are today as humanity. Yes. So, and I, again, not everything, just like a yeah. core set. I would, for me, I would say that sounds like a great college course. And I, also, for me, I think I I would when I think of the visual arts. I think of art appreciation, and then I think of art history. And I love art history. And art history for me is, okay, let's study Giotto di Bondone, the core Renaissance painter who influenced everybody from Michelangelo to, to you could say, video game design in the <laughs> 21st century. Okay. I'll have to look this guy up. But he's a historical figure in a similar way that Dante might be. His paintings, treating them as art, are black and white movies. They're not as okay. thrilling and exciting to immerse ourselves in. When I look at literature, and I teach literature to through high school, I'm looking to create, I think we use the term, literary experiences, mm. to create those powerful literary experiences using a lot of the classics, but using the best and most approachable and for that particular age. Okay. And then afterwards, for those students, like I told you about that student I'm doing Nordic literature with, and I've done other, uh, gotten into Epic of Gilgamesh and Mm -hmm. things like that as well to look at the text that led to the works of literature that they're in love with. But I'm focused especially on falling in love with the works of literature so that later on, if you do care about it, you'll want to know what was the predecessor that led to it. And you'll want to know the art history of it. But before getting to the art history of it, you got to love the art of it. Yes. So that's my approach. Okay. So there's a lot we could talk about that. I can keep, I want to, I would love to keep going, but I think it's important, especially because it's your expertise to move into, you know, more of your expertise. I mean, they're both your expertise, but like your degree is in art history art, and you do amazing tours. So if you ever get a chance, go check out one of the tours. They're not a normal museum tour. Like this is not in the sense of most museum tours I've done, which I haven't done a lot because they're usually boring. Is this kind of walk around, tell you the dates and times and maybe an influence of this painter, that sculptor, and then they move on. The point of what you're doing is in your museum tours, and I don't even like calling them museums, but your art tours of great art in what they call museums, is you do focus in the same way you're talking about with having great experiences yeah. Yeah. with the paintings. Exactly. So can I, I'll give an example. Yeah. Can I give an example yeah, that please do. So I'm going to say the first thing we started with. Yes. Uh, the other day. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So, so we walk into a room and Luke um, sets it up by saying, I want you to walk around before we get in the room. I want you to walk around and find the person you're most physically attracted or attracted to. The sexiest. Yeah. 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 But the person you find sexiest and don't tell anybody, don't point it out. Don't do it. 
but just kind of walk around and find that person. Then we get gathered together. And then you said for them to describe the painting. And then with, you know, just simple descriptions. Just of a, the, a, a title. You would yeah, title, title. Give it. Yeah. yeah. And so we went around and did that. But the point of that was to have a real visceral, you know, arousal of a, from a painting in a sense. And I think that's a really good way to connect with art in general. I mean, not it doesn't always have to be sex, although sex is how awesome. So it's a good way to start a, a tour. But the, that's very different. You would never see that in any museum, that kind of you know museum guide. So I, I think that's what makes what you do interesting and special. Now, the, so the, the, the question is, of course, in general education, yeah. in, in art history, art appreciation. I mean, I, I find it interesting because you focus on this. I wonder if you think there should be like a full, like, like we have a literature class, like full class of this type of thing where they're go in the same way that you would have literature almost versus, you know, just, you could always incorporate art or maybe an art appreciation course here and there for a kid. That's it. So like, you know what I mean? Which one would you advocate for and why? Which so, method? As someone who has in, taught separate art appreciation courses for over 15 years, I enthusiastically say there is a separate art appreciation course hmm. from elementary through high school. Okay, so to be clear, we're talking, we're, you would advocate math, right? Tell me if I'm wrong on one of the subjects. Math? Science, history, literature, art appreciation. So I'm not an expert in the rest of those. Okay. And whether or not they should be part of a general education. Okay. I'm a big advocate of like homeschooling and... So kind of crafting your own. So there's more individuality. But I would say in some ways, art appreciation is a kind of capstone to Hmm. all the other subjects. It like integrates... It integrates... More than literature, you think? More than literature. More than literature. More than literature. Oh, we should have started here. Defend yourself. All right, let me hear. I'm I'm excited to hear this. So what you described as your experience for going to the art museum, that was the first just initial game that we played. Yeah. What we did later on was we sat in front of an artwork and we started reading it together. And reading an artwork is the core of art appreciation. So just for those that don't know what I do with art appreciation, we're not making clay vases or collages. I'm not teaching about art history and the difference between Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. What we're doing is we're treating the artworks a lot like literature. They are stories, almost like visual poems. And the way to understand them and experience them is to quote unquote, read them ourselves to describe them and immerse ourselves in the stories by using our words. And doing that is a combination of being scientific, analytical, as you're making observations, as you're piecing together what's happening in the scene, a lot like a detective might in a crime scene investigation. Oh, there's some petals on the ground. She looks sad. What does that have to do with each other? And you piece together all the clues to put together the story. So you're being analytical. You might even offer up hypotheses and test your hypotheses with observations. So you're being, I don't know what side of the brain that is, right side of the brain? Whatever side. One of the two sides of the brain. And, but you also use the other side of the brain. Yeah. The one where you are immersing yourself in the story, where you're imagining that these characters are real, that they, if you were to push play on the scene, that they would move in a certain way, that they would speak that you would hear them, that this is a drama. This is not a frozen moment. This is a moment uh, like on a video pushed on pause. And you can bring kind of your imaginative qualities to bring that scene to life. A little bit like what's going on here. Bring that scene to life. Now, in that sense, you're using both sides of your brain, the sides that you might use in math and science, the sides that you might use in the humanities and literature. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but you're doing it, not for some, you know, long-term study or to nace a test or to complete a worksheet. You're doing it for the satisfaction of 
getting a story. You're going to come away from each art appreciation class feeling like, wow, we just lived this moment with this character. To top it all off, introspection. It is not enough to simply just read the story and analyze and imagine, but then to identify the kind of moment and to personally connect to that moment. And we do that constantly from first grade on where we look at a character and we empathize with them and we personally connect and ask ourselves, when have we been in a moment like this? And then we see that character as a reflection of who we are. Personal growth and development, introspection, extrospection, all of it. And then throw in, maybe you got some history in there, you got some creative writing in there, but I, that's why I see art appreciation as a capstone. For the humanities. For all of it. But you didn't talk anything about science or Yes, math. I did. What I'm... Observation, uh, analysis, okay. hypotheses, all sure. that is using that right side of your brain. I train teachers to teach art appreciation, and none of them were in the humanities. I co-taught a second grade art appreciation class with a science teacher, mm -hmm. and he told me this is better than a science class because what I've got to do is I've got to have them make observations and put together something here and it's over by the end of the class. He contrasted that to like studying the phases of the moon where over the course of a month they make observations and at the end of it they, they draw conclusions but it's not an encapsulated scientific game would definitely i don't i guess i don't see what literature and poetry would not do that that can do that literature and poetry can't do uh i can answer that okay the visual arts are visual you start off with the concretes you start off like you're going on a nature hike you start off like you're staring at the stars you start off like you're looking at a person and you've got to provide the concepts you've got to build up from that in literature it's the reverse. You're given the concepts and you've got to well, hold on imagine the scene. That's how you concretize. Yeah. You picture the character. You picture the actions. You picture the setting. But where do the concepts come from when you look at a painting? Where do the words that you use come from? You have to study literature to increase your ability to make those kinds of... You can study literature to increase your ability, but you don't... Most... This class is not for literature students. When I teach art appreciation, it's not for literature students. What I'm trying to get is more. what's more foundational. Oh, probably so, literature. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That what I see, there's a difference in reading a poem. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. and I there's agree something that. more scientific about... You haven't gotten me there. Again, this is coming from someone who loves what you do and loves the art stuff. So I'm not trying to... I'm just, I do think there's like... I don't know. There's there's something one, you know, the science example you gave to me sounds like it's maybe because he just didn't have great training in general. He's a good teacher. Uh, because like, I don't He's know if you've seen, I don't know if you've seen like mystery science. And I think what they do is very similar to and, art appreciation. To, exactly. Ex no, but not art appreciation. Point. It's that's, the, that's not the foundational thing. The foundational thing is how you think. So like you gave a talk at third Thursday on art and epistemology and, you know, how bad epistemology leads to bad discussions and bad integrations. And, like, you can use art appreciation as one way to train the mind. I think that, I guess my point is that everything you do in general education should be geared toward yeah. training the mind. So science should be, this is one way to extrospect about the world, to make observations about how the functioning of the world around you, outside of you, does. Art, and primarily, in my view, is how the inside of you works it's mostly about that now you can also use the extrospection element of look she's holding a flower so what kind of flowers are though what is it is there meaning to those flowers or what you know things of that nature but i don't think that's the primary for painting I, I that's uh, where i would disagree you think like knowing i think you've got to start you know you know you've been on the tours where mm -hmm. we don't start with the story or the background story we don't start with the, start with the concrete we start 
with what we're seeing, what you see. and we yeah. build up from that in a similar way that the mystery science theater. I think I remember something about just mystery science. Mystery science. Mystery yeah. science theater. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun too. <laughs> well, he did. No, but, but they start off with like an observation. Let's look at this tortoise shell and look yeah. at it carefully, and then make some observations and come up with, oh wow, the shell is kind of connected to the body of the tortoise. And the same way you look at an artwork to start with, you don't know what's happening and you've got to figure out what's going on. Like you're stepping into nature and observing it. Um, So the reason I think of it as a capstone, it's not a replacement for science, of course, but it integrates, it integrates literary observational into one little like condensed package. Whenever I teach, or do literature, I always bring in paintings. So I agree. So I'm not trying to disagree with you in, a, in that sense. I'm just trying to get at what is the core and you know how do you properly use this? I mean, to me, I think there's a role. I mean, like my view would be that you would have art appreciation or art integrated throughout all of literature, that the literature course would be the foundational. Yeah. And you would constantly put in as, so like I think as a, you know, literature teacher you should be well trained in all the humanities like so if you want to i can share a little bit about how so i do integrate art with literature but never as well no not never there are two kinds of integrations there's one where the the art helps in some way to appreciate the literature and that can come in some ways of it illustrates maybe a scene or it's some historical background like here's julius caesar and and now let's read the play or something like that yeah but the the main way that i love to integrate is when we do not have any notion of any connection and this is what happens so i'll give you a quick example Mm -hmm. uh in art appreciation class in junior high early this year we had a painting of andromache after she has been kicked out of Troy and Troy her country has been burned down and she's a captive and we see her kind of a city scene a slave waiting for water Hector's wife Hector's dead her son is dead Achilles kills Hector and she is by herself solemn and lonely and black in this new place while this whole other you know village is kind of looking at her a little bit like who's this stranger Mm -hmm. and we immerse ourselves in this story and personally connect to it and ask the question, when have you felt like an outsider? And then we connect it. I ask the question, what if Atticus Finch saw this painting? What would he think of it? And Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird is someone who is constantly thinking about how to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, how to empathize with them, how to connect with them, and not to dismiss them based on your prejudice. And so I have the students write an assignment where Atticus takes his two kids to the art museum and they see this painting and to write out the dialogue that they would have about this painting. From Atticus' perspective. and From Atticus, the kids, yeah. So the focus there, I'm treating the artwork independently. And the connection to literature is the same kind of connection that we'd make to personal life. It is secondary to the artwork. So the artwork is primary. It's not the handmaiden of the, the literature class. Okay. But it connects thematically. Yeah, I mean, so it seems like we're mostly on the same page, though. I agree. Because I guess I would just put more of an emphasis... And this is the great thing about having, you know, when you have a school system, not, I don't believe it should be public, that you could have different people, teachers with different focuses in a sense. Yeah. And that's why I'm a big fan of like all kinds of freedom in education so that you can, there can be all kinds of experiments with the different kinds of courses and parents could see what works best for their kids. Because the way I would approach it is I would, I would have literature and poetry as the base Mm -hmm. and then painting would be supporting it i do th- I, that's how i would probably approach it but i would do the same kind of exercise i would definitely learn and use those exercises because i think it's very valuable 
anything you can do to, especially with the conceptual arts of literature, anything you can do with getting somebody to um, put them to understand it and integrate it enough to apply it somewhere else is a valuable exercise. I would even go farther. For me, it's one of the core tenets of education. The ability to constantly integrate between literature, between art, and your Yes, I, I agree. That's the core. I would think that's the core so, of all of yeah. education. Yeah, so like yes. when in literature, for example, we our curriculum gets more and more exciting as the year goes on because we're constantly asking the question, how is this character similar to and different from previous characters? Mm -hmm. There's a game I like to play yeah, over the course of the year called Crazy Character Combos. Yeah. <laughs> where we just get throw all Mash the... Mashups. Yeah, 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 yeah. We get all the characters that we spent time with over the course of the year to that point together, whether it's... Atticus and Goodman Brown and Jean Valjean, and we randomly pick two. Yeah. And ask ourselves, okay, what's fundamentally similar and different between these two characters? Yeah. And we gain a clear understanding and we start to see links and we start to see abstractions and we start to understand humanity. Uh, so I, I agree with all of that. I would definitely, I, I, I'm saddened to live in a world where only STEM is the focal point. And, you know, there's that Robin Williams quote from Dead si Poet Society, where I don't remember the quote verbatim, but he says... Is like, it the one about poetry is to woo women? Yeah, that's definitely the one, yes, because <laughs> that does work. So I, I would say it's... So the quote is something like, you know, an, uh, engineering, lawyers, doctors these are noble professions and we should admire them and you know this is something about helping us live longer but beauty love poetry literature art this romance this is what life is f worth living for right and i did not get that correct exactly but yeah, the, yeah. the idea of you know a doctor extend your life and that's worthwhile and great but what what are you extending it for or the the cheap way of, you know, life. So in other words, I, I think we live in this world where we're focused on purely life extension, doing all these things, which I think are noble. And I want to live a long time as healthy as possible. Enjoy. But we're missing all these other elements, which is why you're alive in the first place, other than just mere breathing, mere existence. And I think art, literature, romance, love, passion, these are the things that give you that or that at least fill in, you know, if you th I think of it as like almost the engineering and the tech that gives you the outline of a life, but the, you fill it in with beauty and passion and love and romance and adventure and things like that. That to me is why you stay alive. I, I don't want to stay alive on a tube where I could see TV and that's like, I want to be able to experience life and to see more beauty and be able to expand my abilities to see more beauty. That's why I try to read really hard literature that's way above my pay grade, I say, like above my abilities, just like you do with those kids. Like I just read Moby Dick and I still don't know what the hell that's really about. Like, and I'm doing it, I'm doing two groups of that and I've read it several times now and I've taken lectures and I have something and I'm grappling with this mysterious tragedy thing and it's odd reading Shakespeare, reading Homer, reading Dante, reading Milton. Like these are not like the books that I pick up as popcorn and enjoy and love Harry Potter, love adventure stories and thrillers. I love those. They're great. But these are things that like expand my desire to be alive. And it's like, wow, there's still some more in existence to experience. And it keeps expanding. And it's like, a, you know, it's an ever expanding bound of human thought, as Tennyson put it. Oh, the utmost good. bound of human thought. It's like, and it's the utmost that it's like always going to the end where the, as far as you travel, knowledge travels with you and it goes farther. And there's just, so to me, I I'm saddened in a sense to live in that, in a world where these things that I think are amazing and the tech and the, you know, STEM stuff is so great. And I'm so happy and admiring of these people, but I feel like we're missing what you're talking about in our education system and in our culture. May I leave you with this? 
So I would like to talk. What's the Robin Williams character's name? Oh, I can't remember. Is it Reardon? Is it? Maybe. I'll look it up as you're doing this. Don't judge me for doing this. I'm- I would like to talk to him a little bit because I feel on the one hand, I'm very sympathetic to that side that art fills in what's missing in the world. It makes life worth living. Oh, it's John Keating. Oh, that's it. John Keating. <laughs> it was... of all car- I, don't th- I don't know if they did that on purpose, but no, no, that's a fountainhead character. Not. That's not... Peter Keating. That's Peter Keating. Yeah. No, I know, but Keating. Uh, Keating, yeah. But I, for me, that that's not enough. What is it? What Peter, what John Keating says, that art f- makes life worth living, that you do the science, you do the engineering, you do all that stuff to survive, but you have all this to make it worth living, to make the years worth living. I, for me, I think that's not enough. Well, he didn't just say art, to be clear. No, no, no. That's Beauty, not the, the focus. Love, Beauty, romance, love, art, everything poetry. like that, poetry, all that. I, for me, you don't think. What do you think it is? This is something that I I want to think more about. Okay. But my initial reaction, and I, there's one little story I'll maybe illustrate. My initial reaction is that's too much of a dichotomy. That I want to see more of an integration between. Okay. I mean, sure. Your work and what that means, and love and beauty and poetry and art and all that. And I'll give you a little story that comes to mind is uh, I've got a student who who's a senior in high school right now, and he's taking my high school literature class, and he's doing some very high-tech projects. I think they're doing some kind of reverse 3D printing where you take an object and it digitizes it and preserves that object. So you can take, I don't know, family heirloom and, and have it preserved and then later on 3D printed. But he's, he's working on a team to build something like that. And we were having a private tutorial session and I asked him a little bit about this thing that he's working on. And then to integrate it back to literature, the question popped in my mind to ask, all right, Let's think about all the characters that we've encountered so far this year. Gatsby, Hester Prynne, some other characters from literature. Who's the main character from Fahrenheit 451? I don't remember his name. Oh, we could use Clarice, who's the who's Guy Montag from Fahrenheit That's 451. That's Fahrenheit, okay, yeah. Yeah. Or we could, we could throw in the fireman, Beatty. Let's look at these characters and imagine that they were there right beside you. What would they think? of this reverse 3D printer. How would their premises, their understanding of the world, affect their view of this technology and your passion for this creation of this technology? And Clarice would have a very different view than Gatsby would. Mm -hmm. And thinking about these characters in terms of these human ideas that live with you, that help shape your perspective on the world that give you these different perspectives on the world in in your engineering work mm-hmm. i think there's i think there's more for me than just simply it makes life worth living and maybe but it you just proved my point i think cuz that makes the career worth doing maybe yeah, so yeah it's but the i same think thing. for me it's an so, integration yes it's, and it's, i agree it's with you not, on it's, yeah the way Don't john keating is it. Yeah. Do the inter- I a hundred percent agree, and I that to me is my point is that we don't have the integration, we just have the STEM, and so we're not doing the humanities thing, and but I agree that and that's a wonderful story that you want to have meaning in your work. So many people like they go into work, and I know all these tech people who make tons of money, make what I make in like four years and like six months, and they and they're miserable, miserable. They have no meaning. They have no thought about what that's all about. And I think part of it is what you're saying. You know, read some Aero, read Aerosmith by Sinclair Lewis and see the passion he has for his craft. Uh, read, and there's a whole bunch of these types of stories like that. And I, so I fundamentally agree. But I will just add that even if you're a tech bro, that you this type of stuff isn't just about, it's about making meaning in your work and in other areas of your life. Because one thing I've noticed in talking to tech people is not always, but often they, they seem to be lacking in the, the relationships and the love and the romance. They're almost robotic a lot of times. And they don't need to be because I think they're at their core, they're some of the most passionate people possible. And that's what infuriates me about how we 
treat kids and an education system by doing the dichotomy of, well, you know, if you read Iliad or if you read Les Miserables, you're not going to get, you know, a better uh, you know, ability to be a better engineer, right? You're not going to be able to, you know, logically dissect this thing to have a better widget. It's like, no, maybe not. But I think actually, yes, because you'll probably be more creative. Uh, I mean, if you look at the best entrepreneurs, they're all actually pretty artistic and literary, like Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos. He started a bookstore. I mean, like these guys are actually very literate. They have read Shakespeare. I think um, I think I read somewhere that Steve Jobs really loved Moby Dick, which I was found interesting. But he also loved Shakespeare and other. So my point is that I, I agree. Integration, integration, integration. Uh, but we're not doing that. We denigrate or we see as like maybe it's a nice leisurely ho hobby when you're older and retired and have nothing else to do, that's literature, that's painting, that's art, that's love, <laughs> that's beauty, versus, you know, well, this this will get me the $300,000 job right now. So I'm going to do just this, and then I'll, you know, maybe worry about that later. And I, that that's why I just don't. Well, we're going to have to continue this conversation another time because i feel like there are all kinds of oh yeah there's so much to talk about i, want, I would love to talk more about the canonical works to which one should yeah. should if any yeah. integrate and all yeah. there's so much to do um why don't you leave the people with some things you're working on and make sure you talk into the mic because i want them to hear it loud and clear and you know touching the art museum tours and literature at our house. Yeah, Talks yeah. If, uh, if you want to find out more about the classes I teach, literature at our house dot com. Go there. Uh, if you <laughs> want to find out more about the art appreciation uh, for adult classes or the tours, sign up for my mailing list on touchingtheart.com. Kirk. And you do salons online. Oh, yeah. yeah salons. So all kinds of stuff. That's a good introduction, by the way. Because like, then you get to experience it. So check out the salons. Where do you normally announce those? Uh, on my mailing list. So okay. go to touchingtheart.com. So everything's just touchingtheart.com. Just sign up and go from there. Thank you very much, Kirk. Cool. All right. Thank you.